So, okay, so it's 2.02, so let's get started. So today our speaker is Dr. Gang Lu. Uh, Dr. Gang Lu got her bachelor degree in physics from Zhejiang University in China and her PhD in space physics from Rice University in Houston, Texas. She has worked at HAO since 1992, where she was a postdoctoral post fellow from 1992 to 1993, a scientist one in 1993, and a senior scientist since 2006. Her primary research interests are in solar wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere coupling, high latitude ionospheric electrodynamics, analysis and interpretation of space and ground based observations of electric and magnetic fields, as well as energetic particles, and the numerical simulation and the interpretation of ionospheric and thermospheric disturbances. So uh, today, Gan is going to, uh, today, uh, Guy is going to give a presentation uh, with, with the title Solar Wind Magnetosphere Ionosphere Thermosphere Coupling Follows the Energy F uh, Flow. So, this energy flow is really what the new NASA GDC mission is all about uh, the energy flow and the disturbances it causes in the thermosphere and ionosphere. So, uh, I, I asked uh, Gang to give a, a tutorial on this uh, magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere coupling. So, here it is. So, with that, uh, Gang, please start the presentation. Okay, yeah, thanks, Li Ying. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for the opportunity to give this presentation. As Lin said, this is a more introduc introductory talk. Um, so, and maybe some, some of you may find this too elementary. Um, if that's the case, Please find something else better to do for the next hour. Um, okay, to save the web bandwidth, I will turn off my camera and let me just open it. the presentation. Oh, well, why? Okay, why does it not? <laughs> why does now? I thought I just, we just test it. Now, why does not do that? Huh, it's already. Do you see my screen? Uh, Lee? No. Yeah, do you need to, re yeah, can't see it. So do you need to just uh, stop it and then restart, re uh, share the screen? Yeah, that's what I did. Okay, so did you say stop, uh, stop uh, presenting? Stop presenting, oh. Yeah, and then do it again, try that. Uh, well, it didn't. Say stop presenting. Ah, huh. What about that thing says present oh, now? Presenting now? Yeah, I said yeah. presenting now. Then I say and share oh, a window. No, the share does not clickable. Hmm. <laughs> oh. oh, now I see. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so here. <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah we tried. So I tried to. For this talk, I tried to use a lot of cartoons um, <laughs> to get some points across. So this cartoon, the first cartoon here, uh, showing the ionosphere, thermosphere, and its coupling with forcing from below, from the lower atmosphere, and from above, from the sun and the magnetosphere. So from below, the forcing is mainly conveyed through the gravity, atmospheric gravity waves, and the tides. And from above, the largest out energy output is from the sun's radiation, radiative emissions, with majority of the solar radiation is in the form of visible and the infrared, which are most uh, primarily absorbed by the, on the ground. Um, then the FUV, EUV, and the X-rays are absorbed in the upper atmosphere. The absorption of those short wavelengths solar uh, solar irradiance forming the different ionosphere layers, the D layer centered around by 65 kilometers, the E layer about 110, 120 kilometers, then the F region around the 300 kilometers. Um, so in addition to the solar radiation and the, the solar energy also is carried out by the solar wind, the, which are supersonic flows carries some uh, solar generated the, the charged particles as well in 
as well as independent magnetic field. When the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere, part of the solar wind energy is uh, transmitted into the magnetosphere, which is subsequent, uh, subsequently is dissipated into the highlighted ionosphere in the form of electromagnetic energy or pointing flux and the energetic particle precipitation. So in this talk, I primarily focus on this upward coupling with the solar wind and the magnetosphere. So uh, first, let's just uh, give you a ballpark estimate of the different solar and the magnetosphere energy budget. Solar irradiance is by far the dominant energy out, uh, output. It, it is come, uh, it is totally amount to the 10 to the 17th watts with a very solar cycle variability of 0.1%. Then the solar wind kinetic energy is about 10 to the 13th and the 10 to the 14th watts. And the main total magnetosphere power is about 10 to the 11th and to 13, 10 to the 13th watts. And the, those, uh, the magnetosphere energy are further separated into the aurora precipitation, which is between 10 to the 10th to the 11th uh, watts, and the dual heating is about order two magnitude larger. And the ring kernel injection is a, is a similar magnitude, 10 to the 10th to the 10 to the 12th watts. Then the plasma heating, the plasma sheet heating is about 10 to the 11th watts. And then finally, the main, uh, the main little tail plasmoid ejections is about 10 to the 10th and 10 to the 11th. So this actual part is a loss back to the solar wind. Just to the uh, put the okay to uh, put into the perspective, the total power consumed by entire United States is about three times 10 to 12 watts. So those energy dissipation into the main sphere it's really really very significant if we can harvest that. Okay, so ne next I'm going to talk about, give an introductory of about the main sphere topology and the different plasma properties. To the first, uh, to the zeros order, um, the Earth's magnetic field is a dipole field. Magnetic field come out from the southern hemisphere and get into the northern hemisphere. Because main sphere is embedded in the sup flow, uh, supersonic plasma flow, so that they side Magnet, uh, the magnetic field is compressed, and whereas the day, uh, tail side and has sunward side is stretched by due to the downward streaming of the solar wind. Those uh, the so it basically it's kind of main sphere is a cylindrical uh, shape um, in shape, and this shape is maintained by various different kinds of currents that are flowing along the magnetic boundary layer. Um, so the the, mo the out layer of the magnetosphere is called the magnetopause, and the, these are the uh, magnetopause has uh, several currents, and they're called the magnetopause currents, and which is mostly uh, dust board on, on the day side, and the flow around the magnetopause on the tail side. So the day side the magnetopause current also uh, named uh, called uh, sometimes called the Chapman Flarrow currents, named after the scientist. First, the uh, predicted existence of such currents in the 1930s. Um, inside the magnetosphere, there's also several different current systems. Um, the the um, this, the cross tail currents, also called the neutral sheet currents, uh, flow uh, from a down to dusk, which then the feedback to the uh, magnetic pulse current, and uh, those currents flow, uh, those current loop actually important to maintain the cylindrical shape or the long tail of the magnetosphere. Then the further inside the magnetosphere is the westward the ring current, which we all heard about. Then the furon current, which along, flow along the magnetic field from the ionosphere to the magnetosphere. And the, this pair of currents is very important to transmit energy and momentum um, between the main sphere and the ionosphere. Well, besides the main field, the main sphere also uh, is not really uh, vacuum, though density is very very low um, in in the in the in the space domain. But they nevertheless they are not uh, vacuum. So here now I'm going to talk about different plasma regimes uh, that define the uh, composed of the main sphere. So as I said. 
following the supersonic flow and uh, when it encounters the magnetosphere, which is present itself as an obstacle to the supersonic flow. So the supersonic flow will get uh, forming a bow shock. Um, at the bow shock, the supersonic flow becomes subsonic and they're compressed and heated. So at the region between bow shock, the dashed line here, and the outer layer of the magnet magnetosphere or the magnetopause is the region called the plasma sheet, which is highlighted by the pink color. Um, then uh, for a little bit inside the magnetopause, this gray shaded area, it's is, is the called the boundary layer. And the low lighted part is called the low lighted boundary layer and the high lighted part, high lighted boundary layer, or most of people, uh, or most time is also known as the plasma mantle. And the green shaded region is where the magnetic field is come, come like coming is like forming this cast, uh, funnel kind of shape uh, region where um, the plasma particles can easily get directly get into the atmosphere. This region is called the cusp. Yeah, inside the magnetosphere, then this yellow colored regions, roughly about six RE and the tail world is called the plasma sheet. And the between plasma sheet and mantle is called the magnetic tail lobe. Then further inside magnetosphere, the green shaded area is called the plasma sphere. And its outer boundary is around the 4RE or so. And the between the plasma sphere and the plasma sheet is called the radiation belt where particles are most energized. Then the further down to close to the Earth, the screen, uh, the blue shaded area is the atmosphere, which extends about 100 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers in altitude. So atmosphere can also be considered as a low altitude extension of the magnetosphere. Um, so here is a kind of overview of the pro properties of the different plasma regimes we just talked about. In the solar wind, of course, the source is come from the sun. At 1 AU, the nominal density solar wind is about 10 per cc, then the energy or temperature is about 10 EV. So the atmosphere is mainly come from the ionization of atmosphere neutrals due to solar irradiation mostly, and also by energetic particles. The density is, has a quite a large uh, range of very uh, changes between 10 to the third to 10 to the six per cc. Then the temperature is about 1,000 to 4,000 uh, Kelvin degree, which is equivalent to uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 EV. So it's really actually very cold compared with to other plasma in, this, in the main sphere in the solar wind. And the magnetic sheath is mostly from the solar wind and the density is about 10 to 100 per cc and the temperature is about 10 to 100 keV. Then the plasma sheet, uh, the majority of the plasma sheet is uh, source is come from the atmosphere with some from the solar wind and the density is 0 0.1 to 10 per cc and the temperature is about 0 0.1 to 10 uh, kV. Then the radiation belt, which is the most energetic part of the main sphere and the density is quite low. It's 10 to the minus fifths and the 10 to the minus fourth per cc and the energy is from 100 kV to 100 MeV range. Then the plasma sphere is most of the sources come from the ionosphere and the density is the 10 to uh, is between 10 to the 10 to the third per cc and the energy is about one EV. Okay, um, so next I'm going to talk about the interaction part and how that the interaction drive the global magnetosphere convection. So as I said, um, the Earth's magnetic field is a quasi-dipole um, magnetic field emanating from the southern pole, then come around and get into the north pole. So at the subsolar point, magnetic, Earth's magnetic field is northward. And if the south uh, interplanetary field is southward and they are interparallel at the subsolar point, when this, this interplanetary field being dragged by, uh, pushed by, so, uh, dragged by solar wind close, getting very close to the Earth's magnetic field, they break up and and the, where the, the field line become open, that means the field lines only have one end now connected to the Earth, the other end connected to the solar wind. So these are the definition of open field lines. After the magnetic fields break up or can reconnect it, 
and the, the, the open filament will be dragged by the solar wing and then propagating tailward. As the process continues, so you will have more and more uh, field lines accumulating on the tail side and which increase in magnetic pressure. When it is large enough, the tail field where they're also um, very close to the central part of the main needle tail, the field lines also have an opposite direction. Um, then they will break up. This is called a tail reconnection. After reconnection, then the magnetic tension force will bring the reconnect field earthward and that driving the plasma flow. So um, this is another view of the solar wind plasma interaction from a different cross section point of view. The top left is the noon midnight uh, cross section where again highlighted the main, and the main part of the solar wind magnetic field in blue lines, um, the earth magnetic field in black lines. Um, the, so in the, the, here's the magnetic pulse in magenta color and the, the dash line is the um, bulk shock. And the, the red, uh, the blue arrows are the solar wind flow, uh, the plasma flow. So it mostly is the uh, anti sound word in the field, uh, in the region of open field lines, whereas in the closed field lines, the field, uh, the flow is earthward. Um, so here's, a, this is after reconnection. So this is called, so called the plasma injection after uh, mag tail reconnection, the tail part is it's ripped off and the drift the tailward uh, to the emerging with the downstream swallowing. So what you have is a uh, anti sunward flow in the open field region and the earth uh, sunward or earthward flow um, in the closed field region. Then if you look at the, in the equatorial cross section, so the out layer, it, so uh, it, then the open closed field line boundary is the, um, highlighted by this uh, dash the black line uh, dash black lines here. So inside the, this open closed field line where the magnetic field is closed, and the flow are earthward and indicated by the arrows. Then outside this flow is anti sunward. Then map down to the highlighted atmosphere because magnetic field convergence. So the inside part is actually mapped down to the lower latitude, whereas the outside part, the open field range is mapped to the polar cap region, and which is anti sunward in the polar cap and the return flow at the low latitude. And the forming this nice two cell convection. Of course, this is very, very idealized cartoon kind of illustration of otherwise very complex um, dynamics in the associated with convection uh, configuration. So this is very simple for the, for the simplest, purely southward IMF conditions. And where if the IMF is north, um, northward or have a sub, sub, substantial BY component, then instead of reconnection at the subsoil point, reconnection can take place at a high latitude. And then open field runs can drape around the magnetopause. And uh, you can, as a result, you can have either a four cell convection patterns like that or distorted two cells. So things getting really messy. Okay, um, so next I'm going to talk about the coupling and energy transfer um, part. Um, as I said, the, at the source water conditions, you basically, atmospheric convection have uh, two cells, um, down cell, uh, well, this is down cell, counterclockwise and clockwise uh, dusk cell because the plasma drift in the V, uh, e cross B directions and the convection means there's electric field, which is uh, duskward in the portal cap and the downward in, at the lower latitude. And because atmosphere is a conductive median and the electric, the, uh, the electric means there's current flow in the, main, uh, in the atmosphere. So uh, the current has a two components. One is along the magnetic electric field and another perpendicular to both the magnetic field and electric field. So the um, along the field of part, uh, currents is called the Patterson currents, indicated by the, the green arrows. And the, the Hall current is by the um, blue color uh, arrows. So um, when, the, when the atmosphere conductivity is relatively uniform, the Hall current is forming this nice cell, uh, close the circles and opposite, just opposite to the convection flow. 
However, um, because the uh, current has to be followed, the continued have to con form a close the, the circles. So because Patterson current is the convergence on the dusk side and the divergence on the side, which means you have to have a furon current flowing in and out of the atmosphere to make the current closure. As a result, you have a downward current flowing on the downside, uh, downside and the upward current on the downside. And similarly, at the lower latitude, to close the Patterson current, you have flow current have to flow out of atmosphere on the downside and the, into the atmosphere in the dance, uh, dusk side. So the inner ring of the Furon current called the region one current and the outer ring of the current sheet is called the region two currents. Sometimes you will hear the region one, region two, that what they are talking about. Okay, so with the electric uh, Furon current and the, the one important the, uh, is the Furon currents is they carry the electromagnetic energy <clears throat> along with them. So the electromagnetic energy transfer is basically guided by the so-called pointing theorem and the, where the time derivative of the electromagnetic energy is due to diver, uh, the energy dissipation part and the energy flux, divergence of the flux. And for quasi-steady conditions, the time, uh, time variation part can be taken out. Then you have uh, the divergence, convergence of uh, Electromagnetic flux is by the this dissipation term J dot E. <clears throat> if J dot E greater than zero, that means electromagnetic energy is converted to kinetic or thermal energy. On the other hand, if J dot E is negative, then the connected energy is converted to electromagnetic energy. So with the, the so the J dot E in, in the atmosphere, it is further can be separated into the term of so-called dual heating, which is J dot E prime. E prime is the electric field in the neutral wind frame. And another term is the mechanical power where the J dot B or ampere force exert forcing on the neutral wind. So is accelerating or decelerating or vice versa. And this is the energy dissipation part, which is mostly determined on how, how the energy, affecting the ionosphere and the thermosphere. And the J dot E, because ionosphere, um, if in the in the in the presence of neutral wind, even though we most time neutral wind is substantially smaller than the E cross B drift, but nevertheless they are important, they are present, especially on the certain times in the location neutral wind can be very, very important, it cannot be neglected. So as a as a result, so the the, the uh, J uh, the heating part is including electric field driven part and the neutral wing uh, dependent the part. And the neutral wing, again, in general condition, because neutral wing is smaller than ion drift, so the neutral wing actually contributing together, contributing uh, to reduce the overall dual heating. But in, this, in today's talk, I probably, uh, I will not discuss um, the effects of neutral wing um, feedback on the atmosphere and the coupling part. And, uh, Talking about magnetic sphere, one important is that because they are driving large substantial disturbance, and that one spectacular manifestation of magnetic sphere dynamics is the formation of storm and the substorms. For that, I probably just give you a little bit of information about the substorms and the storms. Uh, substorm is also called the aurora storm. It is def it is um, a associated with a brief disturbance of magnetosphere typically last one to five hours. And they are manifested in the magnetosphere as the energization injection of plasma sheet particles. In the ionosphere, however, they are very, very prominent. And the first thing is say, you see the brightening of aurora borealis. And the second is the very large magnetic field disturbance at the high latitudes. And the substorm is typically characterized by the AE index. And the storm, they also called known as uh, in the solar storm, is um, they are a major disturbance of magnetic field and they last much longer, typically one to five days. And that they are manifesting the magnetic sphere, I mean, are represented by energization of wind current and the radiation belt uh, intensification. And then in the ionosphere, they are mostly measured by depletion of the magnetic field. 
and it is defined by the DST index. And the, there's different classes of uh, storms. So for small storm, the minimum DST is between minus 50 to 30, uh, minus 30 to 50 narrow Tesla. For moderate storm is between uh, 50 and 100 narrow, minus 100 narrow Tesla. And for if the minimum DST is less than 100, it's classified as uh, intense storm. And the soup, if it's less than minus 250, it's called a soup storms. So um, depend on magnitude of the uh, DS, minimum DST values, and that's how they are classified. So here is an example of the November, uh, October Halloween storm in 2003. Um, if you look at the minimum DST is about minus 500, 450 nerves, so it is definitely a soup storm. So this storm is actually very well driven by the CME from the sun, and those CME are very fast moving CME, so you can see the speed suddenly jump, jump from about the nominal uh, speed of uh, 500 something and to over uh, close to almost 2000 kilometers per second. And uh, they said uh, um, this shaded area is named, uh, is called the sheath region, compressed solar wind, consider. And then they are followed by ICME, and the, where the magnetic field starts to, you know, or slowly rotates. And uh, because of the fast moving CME, it generally interpreted a shock. So you will have this DST. If you look at DST, there's a very sudden jump of DST. This is called a storm sudden commencement or SSC. And then uh, there's a general period um, from a two days, uh, about six UT to the end of days. There's uh, almost a decreasing drop of the DST. And this is the main, so-called storm main phase. And then after that storm, uh, DST slowly recovers and that's the storm recovery phase. However, this is not very, this is not just one single storm. It is actually composed of about at least the three intensification, uh, in, uh, three storm intensifications. Each of them are characterized by rapid drop in DST and here and also here. And you can see if you compare the solar wing BZ and each drop is associated with uh, uh, it's triggered by a southward turning of the MFBZ. So the bottom panel is the AE index, which usually is to use the, to identify uh, the substorm activity. And the AE is a, uh, measured by magnetic field perturbation above 60 degree MLT in the polar regions. So it's mostly a polar pack uh, is the highlighted atmosphere disturbance. So during storm times, you can definitely see the substorm is more intense with magnitude more than 3,000 nanotesla. And so each of these peaks are, can be considered as each uh, individual substorm injections um, associated with the plasma injections. Um, however, um, prior to the storm onset, you can also, you can also see high, rather intense aurora activity. Those are substorms not really um, associated with the uh, storm activity. So why are storm, substorms all tend to occur um, at the same time, but the sub, you can also have a substorm without a storm. And the similar to the case when the later recovery phase, um, the DST pretty much is steady and where there are still large activities in the substorm. However, using DST and the AE are just the rough index either using it to characterizing storm and substorm. If you really want to understand storm substorm, you this is a, uh, you have to using other magnetosphere atmosphere observations to identify them. So this is just very elementary kind of way to discuss storm and substorm using simple index. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how the storm and the substorm that will affect the ionosphere substorm. And that's the reason why we care about because the disturb the near Earth space environment. So storm definitely have an important impact on the summer sphere ionosphere as, in the, as uh, illustrated by Ray Robo in 1977 with this uh, cartoon description of the activities. So under quiet conditions, the 
general saturation is mostly by absorption of solar uh, irradiance, solar heating. Um, so they are mostly equidward to poleward circulations, like these uh, arrows indicating. And uh, there's also always have some aurora activity going on. So you have a reverse uh, circulation, quick, but the during relatively small or weak, uh, quite a weak uh, storm period, they are mostly confined to the very high latitude. As the intensity of the storm, uh, as the storm intensifies, this aurora driven circulation becomes extended to the lower latitude. And during a major storm, they can even take overtake the normal uh, solo driven circulations. So um, the whole thing is just. Um, become very disturbing during the storm, uh, during the storm time. Um, so this again is a movie uh, showing how the impact of uh, magnetosphere energy input, which as I said, largely dissipating as a dual heating into the high latitude ionosphere, summer sphere. And this energy becomes very prominent during storm time and which will cause density temperature uh, and the winds of the summer sphere. So this one, uh, this particular movie, I'm showing the height integrated dual heating on the left and the tem neutral temperature changes in the neutral wind by these arrows during quite time, you hardly see it, but the wind during the storm, you can see how fast they are spinning up. Okay, here we go. So uh, so you can see whenever uh, short of uh, storm uh, dual, dual heating intensifies, you can see the changes, the rapid change of uh, atmosphere temperature. And uh, they are not just located in the, uh, um, just confined in the highlighted region. You can see these ripples kind of propagating from the polar aurora region to the equator. And you can see the intensification of the neutral wind, and um, which is rather large in this, almost uh, 100, uh, 100, 1,000 meters per second, whereas the normal condition is only a few a couple hundred, a few hundred, uh, yeah, a couple hundred meters per second. So it's a four or five times uh, speeding up of the neutral wing. Okay. Um, here, here's the um, the global changes of global mean values um, for the same storm from uh, time GCM simulations. On the left hand are the edge profile of the heating rate by the different sources. Um, so, and the, the dashed line is the quiet time at the corresponding zero UT on the October 28th. And the, the solid line corresponding to the storm time, zero seven UT on the 29th. So the different color corresponding to these different sources, uh, heating sources. So, um, so the black line is the solar heating. And uh, during quiet time, definitely the solar heating is the dominant uh, heating source for the summer sphere. As you can see the relatively and the dual heating at the quiet time is here. However, during storm time, the dual heating is compar becomes comparable with the solar heating, at least for this time, particularly even in some region, effort, even exceeding um, in the in the Ute region, um, the heating even exceeding the solar heating. But the, uh, although Aurora also intensifies significantly, but in terms of uh, and, um, the energetic impact on thermosphere, their heating effect is relatively small comparing with uh, the dual heating, dual heating is out of magnitude increase. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, the neutral temperature, ion temperature and the electron temperature. And um, at a quiet time, ion and neutrals are in the thermal equilibrium. So the temperature basically follow each other, the neutral and temperature follow each other. Whereas the electrons um, have a slight, uh, have a higher temperatures um, compared with the neutrals and ions. And then during active time, you can see that neutral temperature and ion temperature become significantly different because the ion also interacting with the electrons and the absorbing heating much faster than the neutrals. So the um, the neutral heating, but the nevertheless in the upper summer sphere, the neutral the global average neutral temperature at least increased about two hundred uh, degree Kelvin, and the ion temperature is a four five hundred and the electrons are also very large, more than five hundred. Uh, degree Kelvin. Okay, so here another is uh, is another global view of the 
um, October uh, 2003 Halloween storm. The top panel, uh, the red line, the, the dotted line, uh, then you, uh, is how to integrate the dual heating of five minute time scale. And the red line is a three hour running average of the dual heating. And then the black line here is the reverse the DST. And the, so we are surprised, or not surprised that much, is there's a very good correlation actually between smooth dual heating and the DST with a cross correlation about 0.9 and time lag of two hours. However, I should, I want to point out, although there's a good correlation, and again, correlation does not mean the causal relationship, since the dual heating, again, is mainly driving substorm related activity at a high latitude, uh, whereas the DST is mostly associated with the wind current energization, which taking place um, in the inner part of the magnetosphere. So these two processes, the physical process in the magnetosphere are very different. <clears throat> The middle panel shows the uh, neutral, uh, neutral temperature change at a different height. And uh, um, in the bottom is the neutral mass uh, changes at, the, at the, the same different heights. And those are uh, in percentage, uh, those are percentage changes. So the, these, uh, besides the storm activity, there was also very intense X-ray flare. So you can see the change, this also induced the global changes of the thermosphere sphere and both in temperature and density. However, the largest uh, um, changes are indeed associated with the uh, triggered by geomagnetic storm as indicated by here, by the second dashed line. And uh, um, so at the different altitude, uh, the percentage change of temperature is very different. And the higher the go, the more, more effective the storm effect are, the heating effect is, uh, becomes. And also in the bottom panel, I'll show the um, N220 changes. So the density changes are very well correlated with the composition change, which indicate that the density change, uh, the change of density mo mostly do, due to the upwelling of the heavier mole molecular dominated particles to the higher altitude due to the intense dual heating. And the dual heating, uh, so each of the these peaks, there are three peaks in density variation, which are corresponding to the three large peaks, smooth peaks of the dual heating with a time delay about two to three hours. So that's the, um, well, it depends where one, two, three hours, I would say. Um, so that's the time scale, how the global res uh, sphere responds to the energy input from the magnetosphere. Um, so that's, um, as I said, the, besides the electromagnetic dissipation, which translates into dual heating, the energetic particle precipitation also uh, is very important affecting the outer atmosphere and ionosphere. So, and uh, here is illustration how the uh, illustration of the attitude profile of ionization rate for the different source of, from the different sources. And this is from Dan Baker's 2012 paper. So, um, so um, for the for these, um, there's uh, the purple color is for the solar UV UV, which has a peak, a, a dis, a peak ionization at the, about the 100, 20, 150 or 110 or so um, kilometers, and the aurora precipitation uh, peak ionization peaks are around the 100 kilometers, and the radiation belt or relativistic electrons. Is a, has a high, lower, much lower attitude, about 85 kilometers or so. Then the solar energy part, the protons, it even can dissipate even lower down to the uh, stratosphere, about 400 kilometers. So, of course, the where exactly the attitude is it really depends on the mean energy of the those particles and which vary from event to event, from time to time even. Um, that's indeed is the case for uh, for the October storm, and we trying to um, estimate how the different angular particles affecting the atmosphere. For that, we trying to using uh, various different data sets and to combine a global picture of energy angular particle precipitation. And um, so here, again, um, is the is the um, the top panel shows the dual heating in the color. 
and the, the, the contours are the proximal convections. And for the left, uh, left hand side is for the quiet time at the 04 UG on 29th. And on the right hand side is storm time 7 UG on the 29th. So first, you just look at the contours. They are far more complex than the, the two cell, nice, smooth two cell patterns I shown in the, in the cartoon earlier. And the, during storm times, you can see the, the convection is really intense, which is by the, in, the space between these contours. So the close getting and the larger electric field becomes. Um, and the bottom panel shows the aurora precipitation, which are defined by the, those particle electrons, mostly electrons with energy less than 30 keV. Again, this is quiet time and this is storm time. So note that the car scale is different. Uh, for dual healing, we have the high uh, car scale goes from 0 to 50 um, milliwatts per square meter. And the, for the aurora precipitation, it goes up to 15 milliwatts per square second meter. Um, so if you look at the, so definitely there's two things message. One is storm time, there's definitely the very rapid enhanced intensification of aurora precipitation. And the second is dual heating is the, uh, comparing with the dual heating, the, the energy input from a uh, energy particle is a secondary. So you can see this high, uh, this hamster integral dual heating changes from 50 gigawatts, which is similar to the quiet time particle precipitation. However, the storm time dual heating goes up to almost 2,400 gigawatts, whereas um, the energy flux from an um, aurora precipitation is about 200 gigawatts. So it is more than order of magnitude smaller. Besides the aurora uh, energetic precipitation, there's also uh, more energetic particles um, coming from the radiation belt. And here's the uh, NOAA NEPAD measurements for uh, for this period, and the top it's around the 21 UT uh, on the 28th, and the, those top three panels for the electrons at the three energy channel, 30, greater than 30 eV, greater than 100 eV, and greater than 300 keV. And the bottom four panels are the energy protons again at the different energy lengths. Um, for from 30 to 80 keV, 80 to 200 keV, and then and then upper energy range. So one thing you can see is that as energy goes up, the intensity of the flux getting smaller because most energy is still at the low end, lower end, low energy end of the spectrum. And this is quiet time. So this is the active time. So um, and that scale in the logarithmic scale. So it is more than two orders of magnitude. Uh, increasing in flux. And similarly, this, this event also uh, is featured by solar energy protons. And here again, are the post uh, MEPAD measurement, uh, the top row are for the quiet time and the bottom row are for the, um, the, the main injection period peak of the SEP. So again, there's the substantial changes uh, increasing all the, multiple, uh, actually three orders of magnitude increasing in SEP during the peak of the interval. Now we are going to see how that affecting the upper atmosphere, summer sphere with those energy particle precipitation. Um, before that, let me also first show um, the sort of global maps of energy flux in the top for the different source of the energetic um, particles. The, the left one is the aurora electrons with energy less than 30 keV, MEPAD is a uh, MEPAD electrons and MEPAD protons, which those are particles uh, measured by detectors with energy um, range 30, uh, 30 keV and above. But again, notice the color scale different for the different source of particles. For the, uh, for the aurora, it's order of magnitude than the others. Um, then the bottom row shows the mean energy of these different particles uh, for the aurora. Uh, for this particular time, it, it is most particles are in the energy range of uh, 4 to 5 uh, keV, whereas for the mid pad electrons, energy goes to uh, over you know, 150, definitely over 150 keV. However, this part, of, more energetic part, of, um, of the species have a relatively low total energy flux. The most, the majority of the energy um, 
precipitating part, uh, MEPAD particles uh, with relative smaller, lower energy between, third, um, between 40, 45 keV. And for protons, um, the, again, similar sort of, um, most of those particles are carried by energy, not at the very high energy range, but the rather than about maybe 60 to 65 keV for the protons at, a, again, this, at a, this particular time. And the, here is the attitude distributions of ionization by the different source of energetic particles. On the left panel is the aurora particles with a peak around 110 kV, uh, 110 kilometers at about the, you know, six, maybe about around the 60 at latitude. This is geographic latitude though. Um, and the, for the MEPAD electrons, um, they dissipated much lower, around 80, kilo, uh, 80, kilo, uh, 80 kilometers. For MEPAD protons, there has a similar attitude about 110 um, uh, kilometers. In the SEP uh, protons, they dissipated much lower, um, around 65, peak around the 65 k, uh, kilo, um, kilometers. And this is horizontal. Um, the ionization rate at their peak height and the fall aurora is about 160 kilometers. And uh, for the electrons, about the 73 kilometers and uh, for protons about 100, 103 uh, kilometers and the proton, um, the SCP is 63 uh, kilometers. And the, you can, if you recall the previous and so the, the, the energy flux and the, you can see the shape is pretty much um, proportional to the shape of the energy flux. So distribution of the spatial distribution of the uh, ionization is determined by the energy flux, whereas the attitude of the dissipation is determined by the mean energy of the incident um, energy of particles. And here's uh, the contribution of energy particles to the Patterson Hall conductivity, as well as to the dew heating, the particle heating. The top row only includes an aurora precipitation, which has a single peak between 100 and 110 kilometers. And if you add the MEPAD energetic particles, which are mostly come from the MEPAD electrons, you have a secondary peak at a lower altitude. And if you're including uh, Aurora and the plus SEP, so SEP at the, um, also at the, energy, uh, at the altitude slightly lower, but the energy in terms of uh, contribution to conductivity and the heating, they are much smaller compared with the MEPAD um, energy uh, electrons. And here's the their chain uh, effects on the upper atmosphere. Um, again, um, well, here, uh, Top left is the electron density distributions. This is a difference uh, plot between with and without MEPAD and the, these are Hox and the NOx and the lower left and the ozone. So the ionization pretty much determined by the incident particles. When the part source is gone, then they just recover very fast. So, and the similarly, Hox also have a very short time when once the source is gone and they recovers. So for the MEPAD, the, the Hawks is mainly below uh, about 80 kilometers and down to about the 60, 60, uh, 55 kilometers at, at the range. And the NOx is mostly below 75 and peak around the uh, 65 um, lat, um, kilometers and then they coming down. But the NOx have a longer time. Once they are generated, they can last in for many days. So that this process is coming from the day uh, uh, 30, 30, uh, 313. And the NOx is a causes, is a, a catalytic disruption, uh, destruction of the ozone. So where the NOx increase in ozone depletion, ozone um, got a depleted. And this, uh, this actually is very important, have a, ozone depletion has important atmosphere uh, climate consequences. So these are for the MEPAD. Similarly, this is the difference plots for the SEP, and now at the different location, the one um, SEP mostly dissipate in the polar cap region. So we just look at the polar cap region, Northern Hemisphere, Eureka in the North Canada, Northern Canada region, and the Makamoto in South Pole, near South Pole. Um, so the, again, here's the 
Hox, Nox, and Ozone. And in this case, I plotted the plots to the end of the October 30, uh, October 2003, so much longer time period. So one thing distinguish that is the um, Hox and the Nox, uh, Hox actually, the SEP produced the effect is a much lower attitude compared with the MEPAD part, energetic particle um, precipitation. And uh, for the NOx, um, because they are generally produced uh, generally below 60 kilometers and that their lifetime even longer. So they can lingering for a long, long time after the storm is gone. And even by the end of the year, they still have some residues left over. And then again, because uh, NOx, increased NOx causes a ozone dis um, depletion and the depletion can last also for many, many long time. So it has a very long time uh, effects. Okay, so I think uh, um, it's about the time and to wrap up. And so I hope I can convey the message that magnetosphere is a very important uh, conduit for transferring and solar wind energy momentum into the IT system. And geoheating is a very important, maybe the dominant, most dominant energy source for driving some sphere atmosphere distance during geomagnetic activity. And the energy particles has important effect on the atmosphere. So I stop here and I'm happy to answer ask any question you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gang. Thank you for a very comprehensive and uh, crispy clear presentation of the big picture of the solar wind, the magnetosphere, thermosphere, ionosphere system, and how things work in this system. So, uh, so now, so we have uh, several seven minutes uh, for questions. So, um, yeah, please ask a question. You can either in the text message or just, uh, say, just to ask the question. Yeah, hi, uh, 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 Gang. Uh, this is Xin Zhao Chu from CU Boulder. Uh, thank oh, you for this very, very comprehensive uh, summary and the tutorial of this. I want to ask you, you show the one, uh, one side showing, I forgot the time, uh, time GCM or what, whatever the model. Yes, then you yes, show yes. the mm -hmm. you 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 labeled that as a solar heating, drew heating, aurora heating, chemical heating, and relative cooling. It's a pretty early side. Yes. Yeah, this so, one, right? yeah. so I want to ask you, what do you mean by aurora heating? Did you oh, mean aurora, the particle yeah. heating? They yeah. So the aurora basically. So <laughs> uh, these are the. Uh, so part of the aurora dissipation is going to the ionization part, and another part is going to the heating part. So it's a partitioning. It's, we we assume a fifty percent efficiency of the conversion. But but you you also have a kinetic energy coming with the uh, energetic particles, and uh, some of them can convert to thermal energy directly. Yeah. Right? So that's the part actually exactly talking about. That's the part, the thermal energy part. Oh well, the <laughs> yeah. We basically don't see how much the temperature, what the precipitating particle is. We basically, uh, at least in the model, um, is a parameterized sort of way. Um, basically, we're converting the energy flux into the ionization rate, and then assume the efficiency of the 50%, and that is going to the uh, the part in incident energy, uh, assume ionization rate, you know, 35 EV kind of, uh, um, the ionization and energy, then converting to <laughs> basically multiply the ionization rate with the efficient rate with the 35 EV, then convert it to the <laughs> that's how we calculate. Yeah, so uh, when you said uh, these uh, energetic particles mm -hmm. can uh, do dissociation, ionization, or dissociative ionization, that's actually convert the uh, that, that converted the kinetic energy into chemical potential energy. And then through iso, uh, exothermic uh, reactions, then uh -huh. you can release the chemical potential energy into thermal energy. Well, that that's actually true. But I, I don't think that, well, part of the chemical energy is coming from that part. But I, I think everything is sort mm -hmm. of uh, using the reaction rate, uh, the heat rate, kind of the way calculate, but maybe not as sophisticated as you guys doing. For okay, it. but but then how about uh, when you uh, what what you said here? Solar heating? Did you mean oh, the radiation? Uh, yes, any radiation. Yeah, radiation. That's right. Yes. But uh, radiation also can uh, contribute to ionization 
of flow. That's right. So, so then it will be converted to chemical potential energy stuff. Uh, that well, part of that is going to the uh, chemical heating part, and um, but uh, I think the again we assume this, you know, we assume this is a certain efficiency of the conversion from uh, uh, okay from, uh, from energy to the heat. Okay, thank you. I actually have more question. However, I saw Tom raise the hand, so yeah. I will pause yes. here. Thank you. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Tom, we cannot hear you. Uh -oh. Yeah. yeah. Can you now hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, a question on the same plot, uh, Gong, and, and again, very nice talk. Really enjoyed the, the wide view of, of all the effects that uh, space weather can have here. Uh, on this plot, when you say radiative cooling, in, and that's obviously a negative heating rate, but is that mm -hmm. primarily NOx in this case? That, uh well, it, at not, NOx is a, yeah, some upper thermosphere NOx is def definitely very important, uh, mostly from a uh, you know, 5.3 micro uh, meter rated cooling, and then there's o, uh, the CO2. So in the O2, there's a three or four cooling is calculated in the, in the, oh, okay. in the okay. time scale. And is this plot specifically for the 2003 storm, or is this a general this storm? This is or? particular for this time. Actually, each time is different. Okay. So it's nice. And is there a paper on this particular result with time GCM? Not, not, not for this figure, for the energy particles, yes, uh, but not for this figure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. So you, you want to ask more question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Because recently I have some discussion with colleagues about whether this is called a Farley Burnman instability, whether that will mm -hmm. ha, uh, will contribute to the heating of a neutral atmosphere, yeah, and whether right. it will enhance the true heating. Would you please it, share your thoughts? Yes. Uh, well, certainly, Obama, <laughs> I thought I cannot even forget how to pronounce this. Um, yes, so it's it's basically uh, the electron, it's electric field uh, heating, uh, because when you have a large shear of electric mm. uh, or between the ions and neutrals um, driven by electric field. It's mostly in the E regions when the, um, the electrons still moving fast, whereas uh, uh, the neutral is slow. So you, you can converting that heating into, but it's not including the GCM in general. So, but there's a version, uh, I think Jing Liu and even Mike Wilberg had did some you know, sort of parameterized runs in indicating how far, how if, it 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 does have an uh, important effect on the especially on the electron uh, electron temperature and density. Uh, but uh, how will that uh, eventually contribute to the heating uh, of the? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that can propagate upwards or not, because it's mostly in the E regions. Um, but I have not looked at this problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm saying you can. You yeah. I agree with you. It can uh, heat up the electron temperature very much, but. How much will this elevated electron temperature contribute uh, to the heat of the neutral atmosphere neutral, in the E yeah. region? Um, I again, I have not worked around this and have not <laughs> looked. I'm sorry, yeah, I cannot give you any answer. Maybe, but if you're interested, I can dig into it and see what. Okay. Say, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gao. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. So it's uh, three. Clock. Uh, so any more question? So I I have a question. If you want to ask yeah, a question sure. real quick. Mm -hmm. So you have an equation for the current, which is uh, uh, looking at the difference, including the difference between ion and the electron velocity, right? Yes. That mm -hmm. equation. So is there like in particular like E region, F region? So that uh, the the current is carried by ion or electron, uh, mainly carry or yeah. Well, so mostly definitely they, well, electron when we, the most of current flow in the E regions. So electrons is moving much faster because the ions and neutrals uh, already climbed, uh, uh, coll collide many, many times. So the, the ions is very, very much being slowed down. So it's mostly electrons. And mostly electrons, okay. Yeah. All right, okay. So uh, so with that, I think this is, uh, this. Um, we will end today's, uh, uh, colloquium. Thank you again, Don. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, okay, everybody, bye. Okay, bye bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.